Greetings, I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge of Love of Christ Lutheran Church in Mesa, Arizona, and each week, Pastor Nanette Christofferson and I provide a brief introduction to two of the assigned lectionary readings for the upcoming uh, Sunday. In this video, uh, I'm going to present a brief look at the Old Testament reading for Sunday, January 23rd, 2022. It's a brief look at Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, verses 5 to 6, and verses 8 to 10. The sections, the verses that are left out, you're invited to read the whole chapter of uh, chapter 8, are just a bunch of listing of names uh, that uh, the lectionary writers felt weren't essential to the message that uh, they're trying to convey. So, background. Uh, a little background and date. Uh, scholars have dated the completion of the writing of Ezra and Nehemiah around 330 BCE. Uh, however, the events described covered the period of 536 to about 444, 442 BCE following King Cyrus's edict to allow Israelites who were exiled to their descendants, were exiled or their descendants to return and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. I present a little timeline here so you can see what's going on and, um, and see that this was not a quick process, but it was over decades. Book, the book in the Bible, in the Jewish Bible, was originally Ezra, Nehemiah. Both books record the fulfillment of God's promise to restore Israel to her land after 70 years of living in exile in Babylon. This was accomplished through the help of three Persian kings, and there will not be a spelling test. Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, as uh, well as Jewish leaders, Zerubbabel, Joshua, not Joshua, the book of Joshua, but this is a different Joshua, Haggai, Zechariah, and Ezra. Cyrus overthrew the Babylonians in October 539 BCE. Cyrus then issues a decree for all subjected people to return to their homelands in 538 BCE. About 50,000 Jews chose to venture back to Israel under Zerubbabel, and then the foundation of the temple was started, was built, was laid. But construction of the temple uh, wasn't until about, completed until about 515 BCE, during the reign of Darius. Who was Nehemiah? Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes I, Persian king. This was a position of great responsibility. The purpose of a cupbearer was to taste the wine served to the king to prevent any poisoning. Cupbearers often became influential advisors, personal confidants to the king. He responds to news of the wall of Jerusalem still not having been rebuilt, leaving the newly constructed temple and inhabitants vulnerable. So, Nehemiah gains permission from King Artaxerxes to return to Jerusalem. Nehemiah brings tremendous leadership and administrative skills, having worked in the king's court. In fact, the scriptures record the walls are rebuilt in 52 days. So it shows you the value of having good administration and good leadership as spiritual gifts. Nehemiah gets appointed governor of Judah. And, uh, and again, scripture reveals that Nehemiah was a person known for humility, integrity, loyalty, energy, piety, and unselfishness. Boy, aren't those qualities we'd love to have in all of our leaders. Context. Ezra comes before Nehemiah. Ezra comes first. He is a priest and he is a scribe. He brings a difficult word in response to the returning exiles who have chosen to marry and have children with non-Jewish people in the area, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, and others. Orders were given to divorce their wives and remove wives and children from the community. The basis of this action was in response to foreign brides and foreign gods were the reason for the destruction of Jerusalem, the temple, and the resulting exile. So you can imagine, you know, 
the response to an order like this. But you also can understand that those in leadership of the group returning and rebuilding do not want history to be repeated. They don't want to see what happened following Solomon and all his foreign brides and, and then the listing of kings and kings and chronicles who allowed the toleration of foreign uh, pagan worship uh, to, to take the place of the worship of Yahweh or to even be promoted above the worship of Yahweh. Controversial, not without pain, heartbreak, uh, hardship, um, but this is the context, and um, and some would say it's pretty harsh. The covenant of God is being reestablished with this group of returning exiles. They come, and it's like we got to reiterate what God's covenant was to our ancestors and our response to that covenant. In the covenant, we have, in the renewing of the covenant, we have the reading of the Torah, the books associated with Moses, uh, where the law of God has come out of, particularly the Ten Commandments, and then the succeeding uh, 613 laws that get developed out of that. Uh, you have the response of the people. Uh, you have the repentance of the people. You have the ratification of the covenant, and then the responsibilities of the covenant in this section of Nehemiah. We're only going to be looking at the first part where the reading of the law takes place. And then we'll I'll add the response of the people. Uh, Nehemiah 8, 1 to 3. That they gather on the first day of the seventh month, which today we call Rosh Hashanah, the fall new year for the Jewish people, which is followed by Yom Kippur. And then the festival of Sukkot or Bus. Again, they built tabernacles, and to be reminded that they built, they lived in these kind of portable tents, portable shelters when their ancestors were coming through the wilderness into the promised land. They gather not at the temple, but at the water gate. So I have a little picture that shows you the water gate was not far from where the temple was rebuilt there. Um, but the, the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by, I think, 12 gates. Uh, the location of this gate is uncertain, but its name suggests proximity to the Gihon Spring, a freshwater spring that ran into Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem's only natural source of uh, fresh water on the eastern side of the city. Verses 3 to 8, Ezra is the reader of the law from, from, for, from morning to midday. Uh, we don't know for certain what portion of the law he read. Men and women are assembled to hear. Uh, interpretation is provided so the people could understand it because, again, they all didn't speak the same language, and so there was a need uh, for some interpretation uh, because many of these people grew up in Babylon. They're children or grandchildren of those who were exiled. The people's response as they heard it and interpreted it was amen, amen, which means so be it. Verse 9, and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites, who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. This weeping question comes up. Why, why are they crying? Some have said it's because of the edict to divorce your wife and you're separate from your children and start over with only Jewish people marrying Jewish people and having Jewish kids. Some have thought that they have not heard this word in, in decades. It's a new word, but it's a new word conveying who they are as God's people and what God has called them to be and how they are to live. And they realize they haven't been living like that. And so they are overcome with a sense of, of, uh, of uh, guilt and repentance, and they're weeping around that. Uh, some might say that they're weeping because God cares so much to give them clear direction on how they are to travel the next chapter of their ancestry and, and their identity as God's chosen people. A couple of questions for us. One is the word of the Lord brought you to tears. Another question is, when has the awareness of being confronted with the truth caused tears? Verse 10, Then he said to them, Go your way, 
eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Again, we have a hard time understanding or appreciating the history and context. Unless you've been a refugee, unless you've been forced off your land, forced out of your country, forced into a foreign country and have to live under their rules to only be able to come back home again. Uh, you also, you know, most of us have not been in a situation where we've been separated from our loved ones uh, forcibly by, uh, by religious decree or government orders. But that's not the case even today uh, around the world. So there's a lot of emotion tied into this. Uh, most of us are probably thinking, how on earth did these people listen for, you know, three to six hours to Ezra read from the Bible? Uh, when we struggle with our attention spans being so short. But they listened, and they heard, and they were overwhelmed. Uh, but the leadership is saying, wait, this is good news. This is an opportunity to be reminded that God is with us. God is going to renew us and use us to be this blessing to the world that he meant for our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, and their descendants to be. We have work to be done, not just building the city and temple, we have a mission, and that is to be a blessing to the world so that others might know the love of God, the care of God, the presence of God, and that the Lord is our strength. And this is a time to celebrate. So we see here orders to go and celebrate. Go have some fun. Go share what we have here out of the abundance that's been shared in offerings and thanksgiving. Share the food, share the drink, share the joy. We have responsibilities tied into this covenant renewal. The people are to keep and observe all, all the commandments of God. They are to not marry non-Jews. They are to keep the Sabbath and holy days free of commercial activity. You know, some of us grew up with blue laws where everything was closed on Sundays and Wednesday was always church day. Uh, those days are long gone and we live in a 24-7 economy. Uh, but in, in, uh, in the day of Ezra and Nehemiah, they were concerned that people were so fixated on the marketplace and fixated on making money and, uh, and doing commerce that they couldn't find time to honor and revere God and to rest and renew their spirit and soul by observing the Sabbath. Uh, to observe the sabbatical year, six years, uh, work your fields, store up your goods, and on the seventh year, you let the land lay rest. No archaeological, historical evidence that ever, ever was practiced. But this whole idea of tying into the story of Joseph and saving the Egyptians from starvation and his relatives by building storehouses, and the whole idea is recognizing that there's, there's times when we all need rest and the land needs rest. Our livestock need rest in order to be renewed. And then finally, to support the temple financially. We have the Levites here. We have priests. We have this massive building program that just got completed. And the responsibility to support uh, the institution of uh, Judaism and those who work in that institution to make sure that it stays functioning. Uh, in many ways, uh, some would say that's what we do with organized religion today in the church. And, you know, I'm paid by free will offerings of those who give gifts to Love of Christ Lutheran Church, just as any staff member is here. Uh, but there's a sense that we do this because we have a vision and belief that having uh, a place to worship, a place to gather and learn and grow, to carry out our faith to the world is important. So, as you think about Nehemiah and Ezra, you can't really keep them apart. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a historic time of God restarting what was removed and destroyed, rebuilding and uh, renewing the people uh, with his commitment, God's commitment, to be their God. And the invitation is extended. I want you to be my people. And that invitation is given to you and me in our baptism. And that invitation is given to us every day. 
I hope this helps you prepare for this upcoming Sunday worship. God bless you.